Hello everybody, my name is Steven and welcome back to the Storytime channel. Without wasting any time, let's get into our stories of the day. While doing a teacher evaluation, no teaching. Note, this story's old, I've not been in college for mumble years. Onward. While I was getting my undergrad degree, it was a fairly common practice to have visiting professors and I needed a certain number of math credits for my major. We had a visiting professor for the class and I figured it would be a decent grade since I was fairly confident in my math skills at the time. Obligatory disclaimer, I'm good with stuff below calculus but not above. Having set the stage, this visiting professor was an absolute tick. Or rather, I'd call him that if it wasn't an insult to ticks. He liked to lord over us that he was really good at math. His teaching style was atrocious and he seemed really, really confident that he'd get hired on as a full-time professor at my humble undergrad school. When some of my classmates and I were studying together after tests and whatnot, we found out, among other things, that he graded people differently on homework and tests, even if they got the same answer, and also left less than polite commentary on some people's work. Allow me to disgust you all further. He also showed blatant favoritism to the guys in the class, and had a bad habit of inflating grades if you verbally kissed his butt. If you want even more disgust, he also liked to talk to boobs, but I digress. By the time the end of the semester rolled around, that guy was the target of several death glares in each class, and many of us had taken to doing our work exactly the same way, so we could legitimately argue against different grades. Some of us had even complained to our advisors about this jerkwad. We were all, in short, sick of this guy's stuff. This is where the end of the semester teaching evaluation comes in. My college required, yes, required, we students fill out an evaluation for each teacher we had. It was their way of keeping accountability and was also how they determined whether or not visiting professors were kept on staff. While these evaluations were being filled out, the professor was not allowed to be in the same room as it would have been considered influencing the students. Professors typically went to their offices during this time and a student would come and get them once the evaluations were complete. There were skill questions. An example, read this professor's teaching style between 1 and 10, and a part where you could write stuff out freeform. Remember, the teacher was not allowed in the room as long as even one person was filling out the evaluation. He left after trying to teach us some bull thing we all knew he would use as a gotcha on the final exam and told us to come and get him once the evaluations were complete. He left the room filled with people he'd alienated, pissed off, and taught poorly with a method of communication directly to the powers that be, with guaranteed time where we would not have to see his face, and believe me, none of us wanted to see his face. If I were to give that horrid teacher any praise, it's that he literally did the impossible. He got a group of 20 students to work together flawlessly. Each class in college was about an hour long. He taught for 15 minutes and none of us had class after that one. More to the point, not one person he left in that class wanted to see his face for any longer than required for their credits. Every single student he left in that class, myself included, took the remaining 45 minutes and some of them even longer to not only fill out the entire section where we could free write what we thought about that teacher, but some of us, again myself included, got out extra paper so we could write out a full list of that guy's offenses. Some of us had two extra sheets of paper stapled to the evaluation. Many people also stapled copies of their old exams to the evaluations so they could point out how he graded people differently based on gender. The student who took our evaluations to the powers that be, I'm told, also made sure to explain exactly why the packet was three times the size it was for other professors. During the final, his face was an odd combination of pleading for mercy, sucking lemons, and wishing death upon us all. Not one of us failed, and that guy was mysteriously gone the next semester, not ever to return. I honestly can't remember, but I also feel like the final wasn't graded by him, but by a teacher's assistant. I think they booted his butt before he could do as much as think about grading our exams. Why do I think this? 
there was no rude commentary on the exams in red pen. I don't know how the teacher could think they could just get away with it. I would think the students know very well that they could be able to catch on to this. If you were in this situation and you knew that this professor was biased, what would you have done? Let me know in the comments section down below. I suddenly need all black shoes? No problemo. I worked at a big box electronics store and was a model employee. I was transferred to a store in the new town I would be living in to attend university, backed by high praise from management. The dress code was followed in the spirit of the agreement at my old store with very few issues. The new store with freshly trained management, however, was radically different. They would make us line up and pull our pant legs up to enforce the dress code of black socks, even though you couldn't see any socks under our dress pants. You would be written up and sent home if you failed to uphold professionalism and broke your terms of employment. In this sock check on my first day, which commenced after a two minute long store dance and chant slash song, I was publicly reprimanded for not following the dress code due to my nice suede high top sneakers having a white patch of fabric, as well as a small white strip in the middle of the black sole that was completely unnoticeable under my dress pants. I was lectured on maintaining a professional appearance at my minimum wage job and was strongly encouraged to get shiny black shoes or face termination. I thanked my manager for his feedback and promised that as soon as I cashed out my first paycheck, I would buy a pair of shoes matching his description. That bought me two weeks of begrudging acceptance and displeased sock checks. After my grace period ended, I searched through three secondhand stores to find the perfect pair, and then like a gift from the spiteful gods themselves, I found them. They were perfect. Terrible, shiny, black, fake leather high top sneakers with a quilted pattern. They were truly the shoe equivalent of jeggings. A dress shoe, but infinitely worse. They were tacky, ratty by design, making squeaking, farting noises when I walked, and fit his description perfectly. They were hideous. The next day, I proudly lifted up my pan legs for the sock check. My coworkers were barely containing laughter and unable to hide their smirks. The manager was speechless and looked like a cat in water. Before he recovered, I pulled out a neatly folded piece of paper containing his written expectations that I nicely asked for, with his smarmy signature at the bottom. He didn't give up there. He was determined to win the war he started despite losing the first battle. The warnings came in quick succession and I was enjoying myself way too much. He couldn't nail me for my shoes, so he complained about my supplied uniform shirt being too short and gave me a larger size, which was equally short but large enough to fit two of me in it. He complained about my dress pants being too tight, in example, well fitting, so I took the liberty of wearing a snug, handbook approved pencil skirt. I needed to have my phone on my person but out of sight? Good thing I'm allowed clip-on belt pouches. I need my shirt tucked in? Great. I need my hair pulled back? No problemo. My final handbook approved form was magnificent. A high-waisted tight pencil skirt with a black crocodile print belt, sometimes placed low on my hips instead of my waistband, adorned with the largest phone holster available, an extra large shirt tucked in on my small-sized self, sheer black tights, mid-calf black dress socks, my long hair in pigtails, and topped off with my terrible, horrible, perfectly compliant musical shoes. I was truly a sight to behold. If I knew he would be on shift, I would sometimes skip into work in my old, unacceptable and non-compliant uniform and head straight to the bathroom to change. Freak you, Mitch. I love that. There's all these specific policies on what you can and can't wear, so just take all of them, turn it as ridiculous as you can, and make the managers regret having you change your socks, of all things. Don't let me park in front of my house? Now you can't either. Background. My house is at the head of a T intersection. Basically, there's a street that faces my house. My family had three cars. Two normal cars and an older car that was a little more beat up, clear coat damage, not ugly but definitely not a jewel. Our driveway held two cars, so old car and normal car 1 shared the driveway and normal car 2 parked on the street. One day a new neighbor knocked on our door demanding we moved our car because it was blocking the intersection. 
After refusing and saying that we had been parking there for a couple of years, they called the police and they basically sided with them. We were sure it was BS, but we had a solution. Compliance. New neighbors also had three cars. We took the old car and parked it smack in front of the new neighbor's house, such that they couldn't park behind it because of a hydrant and parking in front of the car blocked their own driveway. Of course, they asked us to move it, which we refused. They ended up parking in front of their own driveway, which would result in a car shuffle if someone had to leave and their car wasn't out front. They eventually knocked on our door again and apologized. They had a printed copy of local parking laws, basically showing that we could park in front of our house. Turns out it was a stressful moving and buying experience for them. We're cool now. I really like this compliance because it's non-confrontational, there was no anger or attitude being exchanged between these people. It was simply something small but effective that they could do to get back at them. Malicious Compliance Tribute Grandpa vs. U.S. Military This is a cool story about the acts of malicious compliance of my grandfather who died a couple of weeks ago. Setting the scene A week after graduating college, first in his family, Grandpa, a very gentle, non-confrontational kind of guy with a mischievous streak, gets drafted into the U.S. military for the Korean War. Act 1 During basic training, he forgets to wear his glasses to target practice. His sergeant refuses to let him leave until he's hit the target at least once. Grandpa is a decent hunter, but now he can't even see the target. They're out there for hours. Finally, the sergeant comes up and tells him he hit the target. Grandpa checks the target. The hole was made from the other side, obviously by the sergeant himself. Act 2. Grandpa and his friend are told to go to San Francisco and to take a boat to Tokyo from there. When they get to San Francisco, they see a long, long line to get on the boat. Grandpa's never been to San Francisco before. He convinces his friend to visit the city with him instead of standing in line all day. They have a great day and come back to the port in the evening. The boat has already left. They get yelled at. A lot. Act 3 The US military finds out Grandpa learned how to use a typewriter in college. Instead of sending him to fight, they let him stay in Tokyo as a secretary to a general. The general keeps sending him out to get things signed. It's hard to get people to listen to a non-officer though. That's what Grandpa tells his boss when he complains about how nothing seems to get done. Next thing he knows, Grandpa's been promoted. Now he can order people to sign his forms. Act 4 Grandpa finds out that 1. US soldiers in uniform ride Japanese public transport for free and two, if he donates blood, he gets the weekend off that week. He starts donating blood every single week and travels all over Japan on the weekends. And that's how he met Grandma. First of all, my condolences, but I just want to say the only thing you can really take away from this story is that this guy was an absolute joy to be around. Home by 10 p.m.? Sure thing. When I was in high school, I started dating a really good friend of mine. My parents didn't like this because it was a gay relationship. They sure made a big deal out of it considering how they insisted it wasn't that big of a deal. They involved all their friends and my girlfriend's parents and their friends. It turned into a community event. Well, one of their concerns was us having sex so they set a curfew of 10pm. No, this wasn't good because I was suicidal at the time and sometimes being able to sleep over at her house was the one thing keeping me from making a bad decision. We have since broken up, but if I didn't have her, I would probably be dead by now. So, sometimes I would be out past curfew and my dad turned into a little stalker with his cronies. He was constantly randomly showing up if I was even one minute late. It was like he waited outside or something and we eventually learned to lock the door because he would barge in and literally grab me and drag me out. He had even sent some of his friends to check on us and even my siblings if they were in the area. Yeah, creepy. Our solution? I had to be home by 10, but my parents didn't say how long I had to be home before leaving again. So I was home by 10 and I would say goodnight like the good little girl I was and then right after my parents went to bed, I'd sneak out. They tried to say I couldn't leave before 6am, but I was willing to stay up all night just to make them stay up too. They also had a rule that I couldn't sleep over at her house. That didn't stop us from going camping. 
Yeah, we'll be in separate tents. See, I have mine right here. I lost my virginity in a tent. Someone in the comments said it best when they said, uh, that must have been very intense. Okay, well anyways, with that, that's all the stories we have for today. So what I want to know is, which of these stories was your personal favorite and why? Let me know which story and why in the comment section down below. And thank you all so very much for watching and listening to the Storytime channel today. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing and don't forget to turn notifications on so you'll never miss an upcoming video. Thank you all again for watching and listening to the Storytime channel.